All right. So we're very excited about D2, D2IQ up next. Uh, first presenter is Deepak Goel, um, CTO of D2IQ. Yes, and uh, and following uh, Deepak will be Max Jonas Werner. <laughs> Get my best Werner Herzog voice, a senior software developer at D2IQ. So thank you to both of you and uh, Deepak, take it away. Thank you. Um, and though I cannot see most of you or anybody, uh, I still believe uh, that I'm talking to to real you uh, on the other side. Um, and thanks for having us here from D2IQ, me and Max. Um, we are happy to share how we are incorporating GitOps and why we are incorporating GitOps in our um, products. Um, and particularly, I'm assuming that most of the folks here would have heard about Kubernetes, which is leading container orchestration platform. Um, and even though Kubernetes has been like almost seven years now um, into existence, it continues to be complex, operationally heavy uh, when it comes to um, dealing with it. I mean, it is one thing to, to provision it for, for just for your dev environment. Uh, that's relatively easy. However, when you start using Kubernetes in production, it's um, it's whole a different game because now you have to worry about security, networking, storage, upgradability, observability, and all the day two operations that you need to handle uh, or you need to have uh, when you are running a platform in a production. And this complexity goes a notch higher uh, when you're dealing with hybrid, multi-cloud and different sorts of environment, right? And then we, what we believe at D2IQ and what we are moving towards is GitOps is the right way to manage that operational uh, complexity or to keep a tap on that operational complexity um, because it allows you to, to, to repeat, to automate much of your operations. The second aspect that I don't find that often talk about is um, Kubernetes doesn't give you sort of configuration management. There's nothing like you, you are on your own, how you want to keep all the configurations um, in order for you to be able to repeat them, um, which, is, which becomes important as you are managing your clusters. Um, and Git provides, because of its nature of like version control, um, it allows you to not only control who can make those updates to your production environment, you can also audit that over period of time, like what changes have happened, when did they happen, and you can correlate uh, certain events based on those configuration changes. So it helps um, a great deal. Uh, not only in automation, but also in uh, maintaining your complex environment. And then when we decided in our product that, okay, we want to support GitOps workflow, um, we looked around and we found Flux um, as, as the uh, project that we want to kind of adopt. Um, and the reason for that is because Flux is um, Kubernetes native. So we it, it helps uh, when you're building something for Kubernetes and D2IQ has, uh, the product is all based on Kubernetes. We have, uh, and you will see Max talking about that in much detail, but having a, having a project which is Kubernetes native just resolve many of the problems that you would have if something is not Kubernetes native, because now you have to map many of the constructs that that project would have built in onto Kubernetes. Some examples are RBAC and things like that, right? So Flux being Kubernetes native, this becomes easier uh, just to integrate uh, with it and have that whole GitOps workflow in your product. So that's why we adopted Flux. And, and our plan is um, to have both cluster lifecycle management, basically having to um, have orchestration of your cluster through GitOps using Flux, but also application lifecycle management. And so what you would see today, uh, what Max would be talking about is on the application lifecycle management and how we have integrated Flux into our product. So on to you, Max. Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for having us here. Um, 
Yeah, I'll be I'll be digging quite deep into how we how we embrace and make use and leverage flux. Um, yeah, I hope I'm not taking this too far. Um, so I'm digging really deep into how we use flux. Um, so yeah, how does data IQ leverage flux, especially for multi-cluster application management? Um, so I want to give a very quick introduction into what Commander is, which is the product that we that we offer that uh, provides multi-cluster application management to customers. Um, and it's basically built on three pillars. So the first pillar is application and infrastructure management. So you can also provision clusters using Commander. And then on top of these clusters, deploy applications. And um, you also have real-time cost management. Um, and we use KubeCost for that. So we have real insight into how much e each cluster costs, how much it adds to, to, the, to the overall cost of all your cluster. Um, and then we have a centralized observability component that lets you easily uh, drill into each of the metrics that your clusters expose, like how many resources are allocated to them, are they over-provisioned or under-provisioned, and stuff like that. So that is Commander, and we're going to, to focus on application management in this talk. Um, however, that also enables like real-time cost management. So we provision the resources for this real-time cost management or the centralized observability component using Flux as well. So it's just the same, what, like whether it's centralized observability or any other application that you deploy on an attached cluster. Um, and yeah, Commander works by, by attaching clusters to it, right? So you have a Kubernetes cluster and then you install a Commander on top of it and then you attach clusters to it, right? And we also ship a, a web UI uh, that helps you like getting an overview of you, all your clusters um, and attaching them, adding them to workspaces, deploying applications onto them and stuff like that. Um, so what did we use before we used Flux, which is actually not that um, uh, that far in the past. We started using Flux like a year ago or not even. Um, so before that, we had a component that we call Cube Add-ons, which was like an in-house component that we built. And it's basically a Helm, a Helm operator. Um, so we shipped a couple of CRDs, mainly an add-on CRD that lets you specify, uh, like declaratively install a Helm chart, right? So you specify the chart's name, the chart's version, the repository, and the values that you want to provide to the to the to the release, and um, then create that resource, and then the the accompanying controller would create. Uh, the Helm release or whether like shell out to, to Helm or use the Go library and, and later versions. Um, and adding to that, uh, Commander uses KubeFed, which is still a core component that we use even when we started using Flux. So KubeFed is a pretty nice tool for those who don't know it for, um, for um, like attaching a cluster to another cluster, right? So it's kind of an, an, an operator that comes with a set of CRDs as well. So you have like a kubefed cluster CRD that you create and you put a cube config in its, in its fields, a reference, a secret that holds a cube config. And then kubefed takes, takes care of attaching that cluster and, and, and then you can create federated resources and say like, hey, I wanna, uh, I wanna create this federated config map on the management cluster. And then kubefed takes care of federating it out to all the attached clusters. Right, so why did we switch to Flux then when, when everything worked so well? Um, and we were actually uh, approached by customers who said like, hey, we have the GitOps workflow uh, applied in our company for like certain workloads and we would like to use Commander in the same way, like, right? So we would like to uh, enable or disable certain applications uh, on certain clusters the same way as we do with our in-house applications. 
Um, they wanted to make use of central logging, of application toggling. They wanted to make use of uh, a central storage, so you can have like you have a single single view onto which applications are validated and where. Um, and they generally generally want to employ well-known practices like a code review before the change actually gets applied. Um, and with a GitOps workflow, you also uh, get a, a simple way to roll back changes for free. Um, however, we we didn't want to uh, didn't want to make the transition too hard for customers already using Commander One. So we put kind of an abstraction layer on top of it and said, "Hey, we want to provide a smooth transition." experience in the first versions of Commander. So we still provide a Kubernetes API driven approach to application management. Um, and you will see in a couple of minutes how that works. So what happens when I attach a cluster or rather how do I attach a cluster? So Commander has the concept of a workspace, which is a CRD that we ship Commander with. Um, and it's basically reflected by namespace, by simple Kubernetes namespace. And then in that namespace, you create commander clusters that are reflected by cube fed clusters. And then these clusters are attached to commander. And from then commander uh, is basically taking care of managing these clusters, right? And uh, in, this, in this picture, we have three applications defined in the workspace. We're gonna see later how that works. And um, these applications, in that workspace are installed on each attached cluster in that workspace, right? So when you attach, if you would attach a third cluster to that workspace, all these three applications would be installed automatically on that cluster. So how does the GitOps view on this look like? Um, so as I said, you attach a cluster um, and as soon as that happens, one of our controllers kicks in and creates a Git repository object. And that repository object points to a Git repository that Commander ships with, right? So when you install Commander, it will, uh, part of the installation is spinning up a Git repository that holds all the application's definitions and that will from there be used to manage all the applications. So every application that is managed by Commander uh, is in that Git repository. So it creates a Git repository and it creates a customization pointing to a certain path in that Git repository, depending on which workspace the cluster has been attached to. Um, and that's like, like Git repository and customization are just pure flux uh, custom resources. And this is how, how the Git repository that Commander ships with looks like. We have services in there and um, and uh, you can have different versions of these services in there. And in these services folders, uh, you have the usual like uh, manifests, which are mostly ham releases in our case, like our commander's case. And then when you create a workspace, one of our controllers kicks in and creates a folder with that workspace's name, in this case, foo, and create a customization file in it referring to all the enabled applications. Um, in this case, um, the base folder just holds Helm repository definitions manifests. And in this case, we have Grafana logging and Metal will be enabled by default. So anytime you attach a cluster to the workspace foo, this cluster will get Metal LB and Grafana logging installed automatically as soon as the attachment is complete. And how does that work? How do I enable an application? Uh, as I said, we want to provide a smooth transition. So you do this by creating another custom resource, which we call app deployment. Um, so let's say you have a workspace foo and in it, you have two app deployment resources called app one and app two. And these are reflected as home releases uh, on the attached clusters, right? And now you create app three as an app deployment. And then uh, the controller I talked about kicks in and creates, basically creates uh, another line in this customization file. 
And from there, Flux takes over. And this is really like very comfortable for us because we only create resources or, or like we, we commit to the Git repository and from there don't have to worry about anything because Flux just does the rest for us, right? So we go from only having Grafana logging and MetalLB there to having Grafana logging, MetalLB and DEX uh, referenced in this uh, Kubernetes customization file. However, um, as we embraced Flux more and more in the process of getting Commander 2 out the door, um, we faced certain challenges. Three of these I'd like to lay, lay, uh, lay out uh, further. The first one is how do we deploy the same application multiple times, given that we have the application definitions pretty statically defined in the Git repository. Um, the second challenge is how do we offer the ability to, um, to deploy different versions of the same application to different clusters? And the third challenge was how do we dynamically inject values to flux managed resources? Um, I'm gonna talk about what that really means. So the first challenge we ran into was how do we deploy the same app multiple times? Because as I said, when you, uh, like we, we have the services defined, we ship the service definitions. So like resources like the Helm releases have like a static name, right? So um, we solved that by applying patches. Um, so whenever you create an app deployment, um, actually an, a patch gets added to the customization that we saw before. And this is why I said, it's not only adding this line, it's also adding this, this, uh, these patches. So what it does is it, it patches the targeted resource, which in this, uh, in, in this case is the metal LB harm release. Um, it, it, it patches the metadata's name, right? So you can have, the same application, like the same service definition and reuse it in, in different deployments. So uh, in this case, uh, the let's say you have an app deployment, my metal LB and my metal LB2 targeting the same cluster, you will have two metal LB instances running in that cluster. One is called my metal LB and the other one is called my metal LB2. And this frees us uh, from having to like copy the service definitions and keep them in sync. Uh, so we always have like a single, a single source of truth for a single service and just patch it a little to be able to be de deployed multiple times in parallel. Um, the other challenge was uh, deploying different versions of the same app, which is pretty simply solved by, by um, our, our directory structure convention, which is like service name, service version, and then a manifest, right? So you would just uh, reference another version. In this case, you could install Grafana 6.13.9, or you could install Grafana uh, logging 6.14. So it's your choice. Or you can both, uh, you can deploy both in parallel using like uh, this approach. And this is like this is done automatically for you, right? So you create the app deployment, um, and since you can't create an app deployment, two app deployments with the same name in the same workspace, you have to use different names. And then our controllers take care of patching the customizations. And then the third ch challenge was quite interesting, and it took us a little time to wrap our heads around this, um, which is. As I said, we have the service definitions statically defined in the Git repository that we ship command with. Um, however, when you attach the cluster to workspace, that workspace's namespace is reflected on the on the attached cluster. So, say you have a uh, you have attached the cluster to the workspace foo, um, and then all the resources are being installed in the namespace foo on the attached cluster. And since this is like this namespace is dynamic, depending on your, how you name your workspace, we have to somehow dynamically configure 
the homilesis and basically any other uh, resources we create in the workspace. And we chose uh, Flux's mechanism of subs like substitutions um, by creating a substitution virus config map on every attached cluster in every uh, workspace, like or rather in the workspace, uh, in the namespace on the attached cluster. And then we are referencing that config map in the post build section of the customization. And then we can replace uh, or rather substitute the variables of each Helm release. Um, so the convention is when you create another service and you define it, the namespace has to be a variable. At the, um, in this case, uh, referencing the release namespace variable, right? And then you get dynamically injected values. And also you don't have, uh, or again, you don't have to copy the service definitions just to be able to install the same application in different namespaces. And one of the takeaways uh, I would love to bring across here is um, that you don't need to be afraid of writing controllers that do GitOps themselves, right? I love automating things. I'm uh, I'm kind of a lazy person, so uh, anytime I have to do something twice, I write a script for it. And um, automating things is just very comfortable, and it's also very comfortable to to write controllers that um, actually do GitOps themselves, that commit and push to Git repository, right? And there's very good libraries out there. There's libgit2, there's gogit, both are used by Flux as well. And you can basically write your own abstraction. However, you, you, need, to, um, you need to use Git around these libraries. And um, in the beginning for us ourselves, this was a little weird. Like we were used to creating Kubernetes resources and interacting with the Kubernetes API. But as we got more and more into it, uh, we got more intimate with yeah, just doing Git operations in our controllers, which is a very cool thing. Um, so how do we envision the future of using Flux in our product? Um, we would like to make more use of Flux native resources to, uh, to be able to provide users with an application status, right? So uh, customizations have a nice way of specifying health checks. Um, uh, in a declarative way, so just add health checks to the customization, and then a customized controller will take care of setting the customization status. And the only thing that you, that you or rather uh, Commander and our controllers have to do is look at this customization and see whether the application is healthy or not. So you don't have to drill into the application's details and see whether the deployment works or everything that's done by the application definition author, right? Who writes the health checks, which is really nice. And our mentality around this is upstream first. So anytime we, we, uh, we have a challenge in front of us, um, we look like out uh, to the world to see whether there's a project that already solves this problem for us, like an open source project. Um, and then we embrace it, we use it, we make use of it. And that's the same way how we started using Flux because it solved a lot of the problems that we had, a lot of the, a lot of the, the uh, features that we needed. And then uh, we basically ditched our own implementation uh, of parts of it and embraced Flux. And that worked very well, right? Um, and then other features are, we wanna provide the ability to uh, use multiple Git repositories. Because as I said, at the moment, it's like one central Git repository, um, but for better isolation and to be able to let users actually use a clone and commit to the Git repository, we need isolation because otherwise you can, yeah, like you can see everything, every, every cluster has deployed. Um, and 
a feature that we really like is remote customization application. Um, so customizations have this cube config field. Um, so we wouldn't even have to create customizations on the attached clusters anymore, but could just create customizations on a management cluster for each attached cluster and just add the attached clusters cube config there and would have everything on the attached cluster. This has pros and cons, and we're still evaluating whether we want to do that or not. Otherwise, um, reach out to us. I hope I, 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 I didn't overwhelm you with, uh, with flux details and um, really digging into it. Um, reach out to me personally on Twitter. Uh, we hang around in the flux channel and the CNCF Slack. And we also hang around in the SIG multi-cluster Kubernetes Slack channel. Thanks. Thanks so much, Max. Uh, it's great. We just have like a couple minutes. Uh, we had a question first asking in Slack, is Commander open source? No, it's not. <laughs> I don't know if Deepak has a longer answer to that. I don't. Excellent. It's a yes or no question, and you answered. Oh, Deepak. So we we are a very small group here of engineers, and uh, when we when we evaluate whether we want to uh, open source something or not, the intention is there. It's just that the bandwidth is not there because we don't want something to open source and let it float and let's say hey somebody else manage it because. It's easy to just open source the code, but when we say really open source, it's a hell lot of an effort. And I know folks from here who have been involved in open source, it's a hell lot of an effort. Um, so right now it's more about the bandwidth question, not the intention. So, so yeah, we'll see if in future we would be able to open source it. And it's commander by K, I know. The, uh, we go by K for everything. So we have three products, Convoy, Commander, and Captain, all are by K. <laughs> Great, yes. I think because of Kubernetes, the ecosystem is trying to use up every possibility of converting a letter to K. <laughs> You're That's right. right. Um, thank you. Uh, and if there are any more questions, um, uh, as I mentioned, we're on the Slack, so we can uh, continue to. <laughs> I see. I see Lee posting an ecosystem with a K. <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll keep working <laughs> on that. Um, and just quick shout out, um, you know, I've heard from uh, definitely in conversation with the uh, Flux maintainers, they're very thankful for D2IQ people in the community and in the company contributing quite a bit to Flux. It's been um, great hearing positive things about the collaboration. And that's what's so great about the community and Lee, the ecosystem. <laughs> so with that, um, I thank you very much. And uh, it was a fantastic talk. And uh, we'll continue co uh, chatting in Slack. Thank so you with for that, having us. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having us.